I was just learning French for my next Miraculous Ladybug video. And I was learning using Skillshare. Skillshare, the sponsor of this video, is an online learning community with thousands of classes tailor-made to help you push your creative journey forward. It's the best way to better your skills for your business, personal growth, even self-care and discovery. I chose social media, film and video, and entrepreneurship to help me find what I'm looking for, and they make a page specifically for you to get you started. I know a lot of you wanna start your own business. Why not design your own logo using one of their courses? Make it just the way you want it. Now is the perfect time to invest in yourself. With Skillshare, you can engage in all of your passions all year long. And maybe you'll finally keep those New Year's resolutions. The first 1,000 people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment. Now, if you'll excuse me, I really wanna actually be able to go to France. I'm not even joking. So this is, I'm, I'm actually going to use this service. There was a Goosebumps TV series? That's right, the children's horror fiction written by R.L. Stein and published by the almighty Scholastic Publishing had itself its own TV series that lasted four seasons beginning in 1995. And also apparently there's like a reboot that was announced in 2020 that's gonna be on Disney Plus, so that's a thing. Now opposed to the films that some of you may know about, they focused on adapting the specific stories of the book into TV episodes. So if you have read the books, you will no doubt see things that you recognize. I watched this show when I was avoiding anything scary. Literally the Corpse Bride trailer, when I was this young, gave me nightmares. I was a very sensitive kid, but for some reason this show just grabbed me. I never got my hands on the Goosebumps books because they were always checked out at the library, so I never had the pleasure of knowing what a Goosebumps story felt like. But at the very least I had the Goosebumps TV show to give me a glimpse into what all of you people who are apparently better than me had experienced. So let's take a look and leave in the comments if you think this show is a faithful adaptation of the stories, or if it's just a bad show that should be forgotten. One of the best parts I always thought was seeing R.L. Stein himself introduce the story. And this show was released in the mid 90s and shows back then just had a different vibe. I mean, now when we see a horror show for kids, it's not really scary. The vibes are still very childish, but here with a massive amount of masks, the sounds as if they're speaking through a radio, uh, well, radio, well, uh, that's probably just because audio recording wasn't as good as it was now, but it still adds to the vibe. If you want to sh a good show for Halloween, I usually like going back to some of the older movies and shows. Sometimes when you get horror right, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And for an introduction to something scary, I always felt like Goosebumps was a good start, especially if you were a little baby like I was. It smiled at me. Uh, what is up with you? It's mouth opened and it smiled at me. Horror is one of those genres that's always had to work on a small budget, but that's always been a good thing in my opinion. Horror isn't something you just make with CGI or special effects. Horror is something you need to have an understanding of with the human psyche. You can make the most terrifying creature in the world, but it's everything around that creature that makes it scary. Now the creature, not really the creature itself. You're forced to be smarter with how you write the show. You have to get creative. And since the R.L. Stein books had a lot of success, they no doubt had a lot of faith in the series when, it, when making it. Whoa, and that head. It looks so real, where'd you- Well, hold on there. I know you need the audience to lift their suspension of disbelief a little bit for this show since you have more constraints, but now you're just asking too much from us. Now that wasn't too scary, was it? Let's ask my family. Mom? Dad? What did you think? That's smart. Add a little humor at the end, just in case the kids got a little too into it. Helps to ground them. The length of each episode will differ, either between 48 minutes or 24 minutes. They would save the long 48 minute episodes for special episodes, or usually split them into two episodes themselves. Ones that had more effort and love put into it would be the extended 48 minute episodes, or because it was based off a book that was more popular than some of the others. <laughs> My glasses! Zeke! I can't find my glasses! Well, jinkies, Zeke! You better go help her before there's a g g g g g ghost If the situation was reversed, would you go- I don't think they'd let me play Esmeralda. Not with that attitude, they won't. Some episodes aren't as scary or suspenseful as others, but that's to be expected when you're making 75 episodes. But 
not every scene is supposed to be scary. When making the show, they knew it was okay for some episodes to be more funny than scary. They sort of found a balance. So long as the show was entertaining was all that mattered. I'm telling you, I'm caught in a time warp. <gasps> a time warp? I don't know, I didn't see any pelvic thrusts. Maybe you should do the time warp again. It seems like these that I'm talking about. I know it's a dream sequence, so it would work best for having CGI, but when it looks bad, it's really just going to take you out of the experience. Kids, seeing as they have a more leniency for imagination, they knew this may not be that immersive for adults, but it was probably really immersive for a kid. The bad CGI was something they knew they could get away with if they really needed to, but the best episodes were still the ones where they used special effects strategically. Hey, kid, you got the time? Oh, oh man, it now it got really scary. I bet this scene was added to scare the adults. I bet most kids saw this and just thought it was a weird guy and didn't have a second thought. For those of you who have read the Goosebumps books, you would know that there's a decent amount of humor in the books. And the humorous parts of the show are supposed to help create a balance that R.L. Stein tried to find. When he started writing the books, he needed to reframe how he's written since he's never really, he, would, he had never really written horror for kids yet, and you know, I don't think really, I don't think no one had ever done that prior to R.L. Stein. Not only that, but it's known that R.L. Stein's favorite book that he wrote is The Haunted Mask. And that was the first episode of the Goosebumps TV series. And when they put that nearly hour long episode on VHS, it sold over 2.5 million copies. I'm not joking. Sadly, R.L. Stein doesn't host the show in most every other episode. It's not like the Twilight Zone. Honestly, I think the show would have been better if he introduced the episode before it started. The opening music and intro sequence is iconic, but seeing him just makes it feel special. He could have been the Mr. Rogers of children's horror. You know what's a sad realization? A lot of these stories worked because kids didn't have phones and couldn't record what was happening or at least they had a harder time. And ca the cameras back then had flash and a shutter, so it was easier to get caught. Taking a picture was a risk. Now, they need to come up with a reason why the main character can't use their phone. Also, this guy is just eating bugs. He isn't hurting anyone. Wh why you gotta rat him out like this? Uh, let, the, let an alien monster creature live their life. Also, why does he need to transform into his original form to eat bugs? You can do that looking like a human. You you might get weird looks, people might think you're gross, but no one's gonna like send you to jail for it. I just think there's a lot less risk. Ah! Hi, Molly. Sorry. Come here, it's okay. I have a cat that is getting very comfortable with me and has never actually interrupted me while I was working and she's very quiet. I'm also allergic to cats. Some of the most impactful episodes are the ones with that unexpected twist, where you see the threat of a monster only for your world to be turned upside down by finding out the protagonist is really a monster. The kind of twist where it takes your assumptions and throws them into your face, where the author lies to the reader and uses it against them later. Piano Lessons Can Be Murder was the first episode I saw, and it really says something about how this show lures you in, because I had no idea about this show. I just stumbled on it one day and decided that this was gonna be the show I was watching that moment after channel surfing. The thing that really catches you is that all of these episodes are written from the kid's perspective. Sometimes the part that's scary isn't the ghost or the monster, but it's the adults not believing you, or the stranger you met that just gives you weird vibes, or the unfamiliar place you've stumbled into, or having to try something new and going outside your comfort zone. And it's that sort of thing that's what really made me connect with this show. It didn't try to go over the top all the time. They knew what it's like to be young, having no agency in your life, not being the strongest, not knowing what you're doing. It's that sort of thing that makes this show really appeal to kids. I think it's this show that really got me thinking more critically about horror. This is a good basic understanding of horror concepts, understanding that horror can really come from anywhere and what makes the everyday scary. If there's a monster and everyone believes you and you suit up to go fight it, well, then it's not horror, it's action. Kids are 
a really smart choice for a protagonist because there's a lot of things about being a kid that already makes you feel disempowered and taking power away from the protagonist is what makes it really suspenseful. But don't get me wrong, not every episode is amazing. I know a big part of horror is to have the normal feel like it's abnormal, but a mutant monster sponge is just, well, it's creative, but I can't say it's good. You know, I never understood what was so scary about a sentient dummy. I get that those dummies are creepy. Don't get me wrong, it's iconic, but unless the dummy has some sort of magic powers, I can just punt it over the fence. Using the dummy to make it to where it'll commit crimes and frame the owner is smart, but to be frank, I mean, we have cameras everywhere. This concept just doesn't really work nowadays. Even with the Chucky movies, I never could really get into it. Mom! Dad! We're sorry, Larry. Oh. Hello? Get a clue? How about a steak? I don't see what the problem is. The kid is living most people's dreams. Say cheese and die. Now that's one heck of a title for a story. And that, blonde haired little goober, is the one and only Ryan Gosling. The episode where he was so new to acting that he lacked a lot of self-confidence, only to later become a massive star. This episode is iconic largely because of the fact that it has Ryan Gosling in it. I took the picture before you filmed. No, well, maybe you only thought you did. I know I did. This could be an awesome tool. You can see the future with that camera? Take a picture of all the lottery tickets. Say cheese. Well, I mean, yeah. You take a picture of anyone's future and they'll end up a skeleton. It'd be really creepy if everyone else was skeletons, but one person wasn't. The great thing about this concept is that it allows the audience to run with their imagination. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes, like when someone isn't in the picture, who knows what could, what could happen. At her house, I guess. No, she's not. She's missing. Disappeared. Jeez, my guy, you can maybe be a little nicer when you tell someone their friend is missing? Look, don't you get it? It, it predicts the future. Yeah! That's awesome! And it makes it bad. Oh! That's not awesome! Wait. That's not predicting the future, that's creating the future. R.L. Stein does introduce the hour-long specials. I guess it makes sense to ha make the specials even more special by having R.L. Stein. It's like you don't know when you'll tune into a show and be surprised with a bonus. Now, he may not have been the one adapting the books into scripts, but he was the one who got the final approval on the scripts and could shut down the first drafts. I'm gonna wash my hands, I realize I'm getting itchy. This way it ensured that Goosebumps show reflected the feel of the Goosebumps books. When my cat runs, she has this like bag of skin that just whoosh, 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 flip flops around side to side. It looks so dumb. Some of you may not know this, but Deborah Forte, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is the producer of this show. And that's significant because she is also the the, the, she's produced several other shows published by Scholastic because she is the founder of Scholastic. The Magic School Bus, Animorphs, I Spy, all of these wouldn't have been around if it wasn't for her. But don't start praising her in the, um, don't start praising her in the comments because stuff gets complicated at the very end of this episode. You know what confuses me? Back during the 1990s and 2000s, there's, there was a good amount of just messed up content for kids or content that's just for kids, but a bit darker. Goosebumps being one example. The more notorious example people point to is Courage the Cowardly Dog. And now I don't really feel like there's a lot of shows like that. Uh, sure, there will be one episode every once in a while that scars you, but not a whole show. I know this may sound weird, but I think there should be more shows that scar kids. I mean, kids are gonna be scarred anyway. Might as well have a show made to ease them into it, you know? Adjust them to the scarring. Give them small ones. The alternative would be Happy Tree Friends on the internet, just launching them from innocent to messed up. That's no way to acclimate them. And we all know there's worse stuff they can find on the internet. But most of that is just horny stuff nowadays, if I'm going to be honest. And that'll mess them up in a completely different way. I think there should be more scarring shows for kids. We all remember Courage fondly. It was a good show. We liked it regardless of how upset it made us feel. Or we liked it because it made us feel upset, but not too upset. You know, just the right amount. What's gonna do? <laughs> It's that swamp hermit, Mom. Did he hurt you? 
He's a werewolf. You're just going to skip over the fact that he kidnapped you? I mean, if you're trying to convince your parents that you aren't crazy, you can at least tell them what you know happened. Gee, I swear. So, these protagonists of some of these episodes just aren't smart. Just one time, I would like it if the parents would just stop for a second and go, hmm, I don't really believe you, but I can tell you are legitimately scared. So let's go look and see what's going on. Why would I do that? Because I care about my child. Unlike literally every adult in this show. Is that too much to ask? Sometimes the scenes in some episodes are actually very immersive, vivid, really imaginative. Like this kid from a camp walking alone, the wind blowing all the letters all the camp kids wrote to their parents, and they approach the forbidden abandoned cabin trying to figure out why he's alone. It's so dreamlike, some, like something out of a nightmare. The twists they have in these episodes sometimes mess you up in the ways you just didn't expect. Oh, the camp was a government test for one kid. Oh, okay, so that's a twist. Cool, nothing amazing, but not bad. What's the mission they tested him for? Oh, to go to Earth. This isn't Earth. Well, now it's a twist with a twist, and I don't know how to feel. It leaves so many questions and answers nothing, and that's why it's so effective. The way this show does twists, it gives you what should be obvious, like an old hermit living in a swamp that howls at the moon, and oh my gosh, there's also a werewolf in this swamp. Hmm, I bet it's the hermit. That's the twist. No, it's not the hermit, it's someone else. The best twist is when you go beyond that, where the twist is a lie that you tell the audience. And this isn't in the show, but running off of this example. No, it's not a werewolf. It's your brother pretending to be a werewolf so that he can murder people because he's a psychopath. The best twists are ones where you lie to the audience or the reader in this, in this situation and you take advantage of their assumptions. In this case, the assumption is, oh yeah, no, werewolves are just real in this world. A good twist needs to answer a question. If the twist was per se, there is no werewolf, it was all a dream. That's not satisfying because you betray your audience. You had us suspend our disbelief, specifically so you could tell the story, only for you to throw it in our faces. You made us feel bad for bothering to trust you. And that's why Shyamalan twists are pretty bad most of the time. And it's also why The Sixth Sense is such an effective movie. It understood the idea of lying to your audience and taking advantage of their assumptions. Go watch that movie if you haven't. I've already spoiled enough as it is. I know that when I read or try to look up the budget for this show, they all say it didn't have a big budget. But when you have a bunch of episodes, each with new actors, all with unique look and locations, and the sets looking as visually interesting as it does, I wonder just how much budget they really had. I could still believe they didn't have a lot, but I think they may have had a bit more than I thought. Or at the very least, they were very smart with how they managed this show. So much for seeing it. Hey, kid. Hey, it's Colin, Colin, uh, oh, Colin something. Oh, I remember. Phil Collins! Sometimes the best part about the show isn't when the episodes are good, but when the episodes are really bad. You not scare them too much. <sighs> Season three and onward starts getting pretty campy, really trying to rely on special effects to generate the paranormal feeling, and it largely just doesn't really work all that well. This show is very much diminishing returns the more you watch it. It's no wonder season four only lasted a few episodes. Why did you take over our planet? We didn't agree with what was done to the other human. <gasps> we won't hurt you, Brent. Not gonna lie, this messed me up so bad. I was looking at everyone differently for a long while after this episode, but also, do you see how bad this looks? It's like an annoying orange. You can uh, go on a couple of rides while we ask where's your garden. You ready, kids? That's what I'm saying. Explosives, much more efficient than animating the dead. These monsters finally got a head on their shoulders. I can't get over how there's an episode where they go to horror land and they go, eh, it's okay if they're screaming. It's a horror themed amusement park. Someone got murdered? Well, of course, they're trying to scare us. 
and it's a neat idea for an episode, but not a movie like with Hellfest that literally has the exact same premise, except it's just some mass murderer. That being said, I have a Patreon down below if you want to support my channel. Anyway, season three really gets into campy. They just kind of, they kind of just realize that they aren't getting a lot of the scary across, so they focus more on the weird and humorous. And so you get episodes like this where it's just a show, but with monsters. Now for the first time on one CD, greatest monster love songs. You'll get your heart is in my pocket and your lips are in my drawer. Just like the Bride of Chucky, Slappy wants a bride too. And the whole episode, it's just like, why don't you just give him the doll? The guy is in love. Uh, let him have a little girlfriend. And the effects they use for the bride is actually more uncomfortable than Slappy. <laughs> you! I don't want you, you cheap plastic! I want her. Oh! Slappy is a pedophile! Now it's scary. I want to disappear again! What's gonna happen? Oh no! She gets the N-word pass! You want me to send my son away from home to a jungle on the other side of the world for two whole weeks? When? This is just a setup to every Pokemon game. Is there a professor that's going to <clears throat> keep mom company while the kid is away? Did they just start blowing the budget in season four or did they just want to make a movie? I guess if the show was popular enough, they can just spend the money however they want. Then again, they could also just be faking the scenery and doing some fun camera tricks to make it seem like they went to a cool jungle location. Hard to tell, which honestly, good job to the people working on this episode. Little did I know there was apparently a legal battle between Scholastic and Parachute Press, the company that R.L. Stein's wife started for them and Goosebumps. There were allegations that R.L. Stein was hiring ghost writers, which is very normal nowadays. <laughs> ghost writers, Goosebumps, but um, <laughs> which Scholastic argued he wasn't allowed to do. And there was a legal battle uh, for the fight for the marketing rights of Goosebumps that R.L. Stein's wife started because of the bad blood between them and they didn't renew their contract in the year 2000. Also, side note, R.L. Stein's wife does a lot for R.L. Stein. Like, I haven't looked too deep into her, but everywhere I look, they always mention her. She's always in these articles. It's like R.L. Stein writes the books and she does everything else. So, props to her. <laughs> anyway, the legal battle around this time explains why the show only lasted up until around this time, where it didn't go beyond, I think, 1998. And then there was arguments that Scholastic wasn't paying R.L. Stein because they accused him of breaching contract. And so they count, they sued Scholastic, and it's a lot. It's a lot of back and forth, skip a lot of stuff. I'll tell you what's what's happening right now. The point is the Goosebumps book, the Goosebumps show stopped because of all the weird lawsuits during this time. And now R.L. Stein and his wife do their own thing with Goosebumps with their own publishing company. So the Goosebumps show was abruptly stopped due to legal issues. But it was a good show while it lasted. And also it's definitely a good in-between if you're not comfortable with horror movies, but you're also you also want something stronger than like Scary Godmother, which that being said, I adore Scary Godmother and I'm thinking of redoing my video on what happened to Scary Godmother and just like making a review on each each movie. I appreciate this show for pushing what people would think of is appropriate for children media. This is a show that's really unforgettable and I would love to see it re be remade in modern day, especially since the Goosebumps movies just really do not hold the same tone as this show does. They really pivoted it a lot towards kids and it just takes a lot of the interesting flavor out of it. But tell me what you think of the show. Which episode was your favorite? Which episode sticks out in your mind the most? Cause honestly the alien puppets that they did, that's obviously a hand. That's never going to leave my brain. I hope you enjoyed this video. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Stay beautiful and keep playing.